Hi, and welcome to the second part of my digital mud painting tutorial. In this video, I'm going to show you how to go from a static 2D Photoshop mud painting to a nuke based 2.5D compositing DMP, something that will support camera motion as opposed to the static Photoshop version. Also, I will show you how to make the best of utility passes coming out of a 3D render, like for instance the normal pass, the world position pass and crypto mat. Three useful utility passes that will let you do a lot of magic with your images without having to re-render your files constantly. We will also see how to generate 3D space-based masks so that you can apply color correction as if you were in 3D despite the fact that you start from 2D renders. So hopefully a bunch of techniques that you can use to make your animation look easier even better. Finally, I will close the video by highlighting areas of improvement of the workflow. If you find this interesting, then jump on board and follow along. And now that we have some sort of mock-up for the digital matte painting, it's time for us to go back to Maya and set up the render setup. So render layers, say of these. First of all, I will need a character render layer containing the character itself, and then a character shadows layer, which I will use to output only the shadows of the character and nothing else. On the character render layer, I will only put the character, and on the shadows render layer, I will put the character geometry and the environment, the character geometry is primary visibility is set to off, while the rocks, of course, we still have the matte shadow material. I will make an override for the rocks to make sure they don't cast any shadows, because otherwise I will get the shadow of the rock over itself, which I don't need. I just need the shadow of the character over the rocks. In here, I'm also creating a render layer, which I was planning to use to output the shadow of the plane that we have above the camera over the rock underneath, but eventually as I was doing compositing at a later stage I realized I don't really need that kind of stuff for this shot in particular. Once I export the individual layers from Photoshop into Nuke I find myself with a bunch of pictures that I can then compose it together and I use merge over operations to combine the objects together. So all of these images that I'm dragging from Photoshop will need to be pre-multiplied before being merged over and I am essentially rebuilding the picture that I had in Photoshop, but using Nuke, just layer over layer. In fact, this job would probably be easier if done in After Effects, just because of the similarities in terms of workflow between Photoshop and After Effects. Once the comp is rebuilt, I can grab the render from Maya, which contains the character only, and compose the character over the comp. I will compose it right over the two rocks from and to which the character is jumping, and I will start grading the character so that it looks a bit more like the image I have in Photoshop and maybe I want it to be a bit more yellowish. I'll keep a JPEG of the Photoshop file always with me so that I can compare the gradient that I'm putting onto my 3D render with the gradient that I did in Photoshop. In theory, had this been production, I would have probably done the matte painting straight into Nuke. Maybe I would have done some layers in Photoshop, but then I would have color corrected the thing in Nuke, not in Photoshop. So that once ready for render, I wouldn't have to redo the color correction in another software. I'm trying to match the color correction of the 3D render against the Nuke comp, and I always use the JPEG coming from Photoshop as a reference. And then I'm going to use Cryptomat, which is a utility pass I output. Cryptomat pass gives you the ability to select arbitrary parts of your character and the geometry or the shader. This way you can convert this selection into masks that can be used Used to selectively correct single parts of the character. You see here I am color grading only certain areas of the character. I keep double checking the relationship between the grading I had in Photoshop and the one I have in Nuke as you see. If you hit the W key in Nuke you can compare two inputs so that makes it a lot easier for me especially considering I am not a compositor at heart. I am a generalist with a specialization in animation so I have to do a lot of trial and error when I work with colors because I don't do it every single day. I can create several cryptomat masks so that I can control individual parts of the character a bit better. For instance, I can make a mask only for the face so that I can control the color of the skin a bit better. I want to have that a bit more bluish. A nice trick to better integrate the character would be to also make the shadows a bit bluish in general, which I can easily do with my masks and my shadow pass. It would be probably a good idea to match the color of the shadows on the rock now. And in order to do so, I'm using the shadow pass which contains the shadows in the alpha. So I'm not really composing the RGB of the shadow pass, but I am using its alpha 
to color correct the background. Once the color correction of the shadows in Nuke matches that of the background shadows, I can consider that task done. And I can mask out the part of the character shadow that is intersecting with the environment shadows so that we don't have a double shadow there. I can use a gizmo from Nukepedia named XDistort to create a bit of distortion around the character to make it look a bit more hand drawn, just a tiny bit. I mean, you can push it really a lot if you want, but I don't think that's what I want to do. I just want it to look a tiny bit less regular. And then of course I can multiply the ambient occlusion pass over the character to regain some of the detail of the shadows. And similarly, I can use the ambient occlusion to darken a little bit the contact points between the character and the background. As an additional trick up my sleeve, I can use the normal pass and the position pass maybe to better integrate the character with the background. You see that I can create a point cloud in 3D for the character that lets me do a couple of interesting things. Especially when used in conjunction with the World Position Toolkit from Ivan Kokov that you can find on Nukepedia. The World Position Toolkit allows you to create a mask in 3D space. So let's say that I want the lower part of the character to be a bit more yellowish because of the bounce light coming from the rocks underneath. I can do that by selecting that lower part of the character in 3D space. Although I'm working on renders which are 2D pictures if you think of it. But having output the position and normal utility passes gives me the opportunity to do relighting and color correction based in 3D space. The output will be a black and white mask, a gradient. So where the gradient is white, the mask will be active and when it's black, it won't be active. So I can apply color correction based on that gradient, meaning based on 3D space, which is really useful because I can concentrate the white gradient on the lower part of the character. And this way I can color correct the lower part of the character to be yellowish. This means the bounce light coming from the rocks underneath will be more visible and it will look like 3D lighting. It's a neat trick. And if you have a look at the calves area, you can see a nice appealing gradient going from the color bleeding of the rocks, which is yellowish, to a bluish tint for the shadows. And this kind of touch gives you a tiny subtle integration that helps put the character into the context. And now that the integration and the color correction are working, I can put every single layer on their own cards in 3D space, put a camera and animate that camera a little bit just to create the illusion of movement and the illusion of multi-planar background with a foreground, a middle ground and a background. The problem with that is that every now and then I realize that I made the matte painting too small, the area should have been bigger, so I need to go back to Photoshop and make the, the painting a bit bigger so that it covers a bit more ground so that I can move the camera a little bit more. The rest really is tweaking of the camera and of the positions of the layers until finally we get to our result. Now, if I had to do this project again, I wouldn't spend as much time in Photoshop doing the fine color tuning that I did, but I would rather spend the time in Photoshop just doing the basic rough matte painting. And then I would go into Nuke and do the color correction right there and then. So that by the time that the 3D render is done, I will just have the 3D render to color correct instead of trying to replicate what I did in Photoshop. The reason why I spent so much time in Photoshop is because I wanted a tutorial to show that you can make a matte painting in Photoshop Photoshop. But in practice, if this were a production shot, I would spend a lot more time in Nuke and a lot less time in Photoshop, I think. Another thing that was a source of grief is the 3D setup for the cards. I should have made that setup a lot earlier so that I would know the position of the cards a bit better. And also this way I would know exactly how much area the matte painting needs to cover because very often I found as I moved the camera that my foreground was way too small. I should have made a much wider area there so that I could have moved the camera a lot more. If you have found this video useful, like I certainly hope you did, please like, subscribe and hit that bell. Have fun!